Um, so, um, uh, the, in, in anticipation for uh, clinical trials, uh, the FDA is very uh, concerned about what uh, are meaningful uh, changes uh, to to your lives. So maybe we could maybe we could get. Um, if a few uh, comments on if we had a drug that had a certain effect, what would be a meaningful uh, change that that drug would have? Say it again. Sorry. For me, you know, in the beginning, it was such a rapid progression that just having a plateau to go, here it is, it's going to stop at this point, this is what you have to deal with from this point on, that would mean a lot to know, okay, I don't have to think about what's the next phase, what's the next phase. Thank you. Uh, one uh, over, over here on the right. Uh, can we work for the microphone? Thank you. Um, just any any improvement or increase in mobility, I think, for all of us is is a huge, huge um, goal. So, so by mobility, the, uh, an improvement in being able to walk. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, it would just it would be the simple, the relatively simple act of being able to get up off the floor, for whatever reason I found myself on the floor. Uh, um, that would be a really powerful thing to know that I could be able to do that again. Uh, I've spent most of my life pain free and I used to argue that it was aching not pain. I've now moved into the pain phase and so now uh, I guess my biggest thing looking at my future is uh, mitigation of damage or the rate of loss, anything that, I'm not looking for a cure, I'm already damaged, but uh, just uh, slowing it down. Thank you. Oops, sorry. For me, the most important thing is the upper body. Uh, legs are very important, but you can locomote artificially. The upper body is what helps us with the activities of daily living, of functioning, of transferring, brushing teeth, uh, combing hair, and general quality of life. So that to me would be the most important thing to see some improvement in upper body. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any more? Yeah, how are you? Um, I think the, the biggest factor um, would be the ability, uh, a drug or therapy to rebuild skeletal muscle. That was all very helpful, thank you. Got a question. Um, what, what would be the barriers to um, enrolling in either a, a registry or a natural history study? Like what are some of the barriers why a person would not want to get into that or, or would not want to spend the time to do that? I'd, I'd be curious just to hear what folks would have to say on that. What, what would keep you from wanting to enroll in a, a natural history study? So you don't know whether it be actually a cure or not, but it, it might help to um, elucidate information that might help others down the line. Just I, I think the one thing that people with any kind of a disease would have a concern about is how the information <clears throat> could be used against you, whether you're applying for life insurance, health insurance, disability insurance, future job employment prospects, and the like. That would be, if there was one thing that would, uh, if you could be assured that it would be held in confidence and it could not be used at some other point in time, and, <coughs> excuse me, as you all see, we sign all these consent forms, there's really no way to guarantee that that does not come back to somehow haunt you down the road in a, some completely un unrelated fashion. Sure. Uh, for me, for the registration, I guess I just thought if, if I registered at one site, I didn't think about registering somewhere else. You, know, you would think they would be connected some way. So I think it was lack of information to know to go and register for the different registries because they, was, they serve different purposes, it seems, like what I've learned today. I think in looking at my family, sometimes they don't understand the importance of it. 
how important that is. They just don't take the time because they don't understand the relevance. Anybody who's done research or done papers knows it is, but other people sometimes don't. Yeah. I think, I think for me, it would be co cost. The cost of going to the doctor on a regular basis or, or the cost of getting to the center. So the natural history study is that kind of the trigger, and, and if I have to travel there mm -hmm. and stay, uh, and the airfare, and, and the, so the, 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 the natural history study doesn't come to me, I have to go to it. And I think if we could get the study to go to the patients, rather than the patients having to go to the centers, um, we, could, we could move rapidly on that end. I, I, that, but for me, I think that, that's the biggest obstacle, is just that the time and the expense of going to the doctor every six months or one year, uh, and the fact that it might not be local. Sure. I, I, my background is more in clinical trials, and I do know that that's a, a concern for all patients as well, that um, what exactly is covered and what's not, because just being in a clinical trial and getting free care or even access to a free medication, while it can be enticing if you have to spend a lot of time uh, paying out-of-pocket expenses to travel or to stay somewhere in a hotel and some of the more logistical and granular details, I, I can appreciate that, Dan. Having uh, you know. participated in a clinical trial, I could probably talk a fair length about it. It was really a remarkable experience. Uh, but what I would highlight to this question, I would say, is uh, since FSH has such an intra-family connection, uh, one of the issues I think we see a lot is concern by extended family members about what one person's participation may mean for the rest of the family, particularly for family members who may not uh, want to be uh, addressing the issue just yet. The one thing I wanted to make a comment, I think this is where the patient advocacy organizations become so important, is in the natural history studies. Unfortunately, natural history studies are not sexy, and no one wants to fund them, and yet they are the foundation of anything that we will do in terms of clinical trials. Uh, Rochester was lucky that in 1990 we were funded for a three-year natural history study and we did it. We learned a lot from it, but based on all the other stuff that we have learned over the last 30 years, I think it's important again to do more concurrent natural history studies that can be maybe used uh, for clinical trials going forward if you're not going to use a placebo arm. Um, so again, I cannot say enough about the importance of natural history studies and biomarkers and outcome measures. And I appreciate the costs uh, involved, both of time and money, but I think this is where your participation in terms of time and the, the patient organization's time, um, effort in terms of money, I think, becomes very helpful. Limiting um, things to the face, I would like to know um, if there was one area that can be improved the most on the face, what would everyone want it to be? You got your answer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, where are the microphones? We have a question in the central. Uh, Excuse me, I, I, I wanted to ask a question uh, which is not at all related to my research field, which is molecular biology. But I heard from uh, the people involved in the clinical trial with antioxidant in Montpellier that um, many patients had uh, sleep disorders. And I was wondering whether this was something that was very common, common ab among you. Uh, I have the microphone. I don't know if anybody's ahead of me, but for Dr. Bohin's question about what would we want, I'm on, the, uh, on your left side of, of the room. Uh, the question for me regarding uh, what I would want from uh, some in, you know, feedback from my condition is the, uh, I, I get this condition of every so often, every six to eight weeks, eyelashes growing into my eye and poking uh, me. And, you know, and I feel it's very uncomfortable, and I have the 
to go to an optometrist or an ophthalmologist who just literally plucks them uh, out of my eye and, and then it's instantaneous feel, feeling better. And it happens every six to eight weeks. So I was just wondering, you know, is that something because of the FSH that the eyelids are just, the muscles are not you know, strong enough to, uh, to, to, to be in the eye properly and not get that issue? Yeah. Um, there's um, actually a, an easy solution for that. Um, the muscles that go around the eye, the portion that is close to the eyelid, maintains the posture of the, of the eyelashes. Um, it's called the um, pre-tassel, the portion that really is on around the eyelid margin. So if that is weak, the eyelid margin is going to roll down. So it's like an intortion, and then the eyelashes will be pushing on the, eye, on the corner, and it's irritating. Um, so there are simple surgeries for that, and usually it's um, uh, you put some sutures to evet, force the eyelid margin to go up. And usually, if you see any oculoplastics person, um, any eyelid surgeon, they can do that for you. It's, it's pretty straightforward. I, I had a response to the question someone asked before about uh, more participation in, in the natural history trials and, and the expense of going to wherever it is. The concept of regionalization. Now, you're in Rochester, but there are an awful lot of people who can get to New York City a whole lot easier than we can get to Rochester. So if you had a colleague in Manhattan who would collaborate with you, and, and similarly, Boston. You know, there, there are various, maybe not Worcester, <laughs> you know, but maybe Boston would, would uh, be a better draw and, yeah. and reduce the expense and increase the participation. Um, I, I guess. I have another another perspective on natural history. Um, I just I, I wonder I wonder if if one might identify certain subpopulations uh, for natural history where the disease is progressing rapidly, um, and it might be easier to acquire uh, data there. So perhaps if there was a a, a stratification. Uh, adolescent boys, postmenopausal women, just gone into the wheelchair, um, certain kind of acceleration of weakness. That that, that gave me a rationale, um, where I felt that there was um, a, a faster reaction to the data. So that's Dan, that, that's a great point because I think um, as we try to characterize the different subpopulations within FSH, not just you know the FSH1 or 2 or infantile onset, but as we come up with more and more terms, I think as we get that more defining, I think we can prioritize maybe those more vulnerable populations or the faster um, progressing po populations and should probably rightly identify and prioritize those higher to put our resources behind them as well as capital. Mm -hmm.